Hello, I'm Don Mitchell. Welcome back to Business Basics. Today we'll be continuing to look at ways to reduce investments uh, and our focus will be in Lesson 39, which is entitled Reduce Investments in Building Land and Equipment. Uh, and in this case, I'd like to begin by quoting from Psalm 62, verses 9 to 10 in the New King James Version. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. In the last lesson, we began looking at general purpose ways to gain some of the same benefits that producing almost instantly provides. This lesson will continue that examination by considering how to constructively reduce your and your stakeholders' investments in buildings, land, and equipment. We look first to reducing building investments. Here I'd like to begin by quoting from uh, Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. What do I mean by building investments? These are funds expended for ownership of or leasehold improvements to any structure that rests on land. While land almost always appreciates the market value over the long run, the value of buildings almost always depreciates due to wear, tear, and obsolescence. The market value of new special purpose buildings on the open market immediately is a big discount from the cost of erecting them. Even if buildings uh, don't depreciate market value, the maintenance to keep them sound may cumulatively exceed the original building cost. I'm often reminded of such historical patterns when I drive on Route 128, the storied technology highway that rings Boston. Just north of my home, the road passes by the former Polaroid production facilities for camera and film. When the buildings were completed in the 1950s, they were technological marvels. Today, they uh, have been gutted and are being rebuilt to be the headquarters of a shoe company. The land beneath the data structures is probably worth more than 100 times the original purchase price. I'm sure that the only reason the structures are being rebuilt rather than destroyed is to avoid digging up the land and possibly being required to clean up any undiscovered chemicals that have been spilled into the ground over 50 years. If the Polaroid Corporation spent the same amount of money as it did on these buildings to purchase adjoining land and direct general office space, the company would never have gone into bankruptcy and still would be worth billions of dollars today as a commercial property owner. But the company put its money in the wrong investments as well as spending more than was necessary. To conduct its original photography business, Polaroid obviously needed film and cameras. Let's look at the possible alternatives today to building plants on prime commercial real estate that is more suitable for offices. How can a manufacturer avoid investing in special purpose structures to produce its unique offerings? While there are hundreds of choices, these eight alternatives are usually among the best now. First, outsource production to more effective suppliers. Second, outsource most production to more effective suppliers and simply do some final assembly and testing in your own facilities. Third, redesign the offering so that the physical aspects are minimized while the virtual aspects such as software programs, electronic presences are maximized. For at least rather own your buildings where the approach provides cost and investment savings for your offering supply chain. Five, producing countries where facility costs are very inexpensive and transportation costs to customers' locations are low. Six, use production methods that can be applied in low-cost, general-purpose buildings. Seven, narrow your line of offerings to just the most successful and produce them in space-saving ways. Eight, take advantage of scale effects when larger facilities can substantially lower the cost of building investments per unit of output. If you're a service provider, how can you uh, avoid having investments in any buildings? Again, there are many choices, but eight categories typically provide the most helpful answers today. First, redesign your services so they can be provided by more effective suppliers. Second, redesign your services so they can be conducted by employees working at home or in public places. Third, redesign office layouts so that multiple employees can take turns sharing the same space through something like an office hotel concept. Redesign service work so that more often it can be provided through electronic automation. Five, lease rather than own your facilities where that provides cost and investment savings for your offering supply chains. Six, base your services in countries where facility costs are very inexpensive and communications costs to provide services are low. 
Seven, these service methods that can be applied in general purpose buildings. Eight, narrow your line of offering to just the most successful and produce them in space saving ways. If you're a retailer, how can you avoid having building investments for places to stock and display your offerings? Here are nine suggestions. First, shift to selling online and on television. Second, set up temporary sales sites, such as for auctions. Three, restrict what you offer very fast selling high priced goods. Or arrange for customers to make long-term purchase commitments, and then ship the items directly to them from the producer to wholesaler. Five, ask suppliers to provide or pay for facilities where such an approach can provide integrated, more effective, and lower-cost operations for other retailers and you. Six, lease rather own your facilities where that provides cost and investment savings for the supply chain. Seven, operating countries where facility and transportation costs are very low compared to selling costs, selling prices rather. Eight, use business methods can be applied in general purpose buildings. Nine, narrow your line of offerings to just the most successful ones to provide them in space saving ways. By looking at such choices, be sure to consider any trade offs involved. For instance, you don't want to reduce building investments in ways that greatly reduce revenues. Such an unfavorable result might occur for retail or high quality fur coats, began selling them in card tables temporarily located on city streets. Ideally, you want to employ business model innovations and also increase revenues, lower operating costs, and eliminate the need for other investments. Amazon.com has been a uh, case in point for showing the importance of making such trade-offs. The company originally planned to ask wholesalers to ship all order goods directly to customers, so Amazon wouldn't need any facilities except for its headquarters and computers. As the company added more product lines, Amazon learned that customers wanted to avoid shipping costs. One of the most effective ways to reduce such costs was to combine multiple order items into one package. The company eventually put in a specialized warehouse to make it simpler and less costly to do such multiple item shipping. As a result, the company gained more sales and reduced costs, but it still avoided the, uh, substantial retail building investments and costs like competitors such as Barnes Noble, Best Buy, and Walmart have. As you can see, the ideal business solution uh, may not be the one that aims primarily at minimizing investments in buildings. Have a business model optimizes the overall opportunity to produce more sales, to cut costs, and reduce total investments. Your thinking shouldn't stop at the limits of your organizational boundaries. Consider how you can slice building investments for suppliers, partners, customers, 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 end users, and the other stakeholders. Otherwise, you're just moving the cost of building investments around rather than actually avoiding them. When you just try to shift the investments to others, you'll probably find your profitability and cash flow are eventually reduced in some new, indirect ways. In many manufacturing businesses, it's not unusual for there to be $1 spent on a company's building investments to support every $6 of sales. A more desirable ratio would be to have $1 of company building investments to support every $50 in sales. How low can you go without harming sales, increasing costs, or expanding total investments in other ways? Here's where offering design can play a role. There are many different ways to serve the same need. Some of them are much more investment intensive than others. Look hard for the choices that don't require much investment in buildings. What's the key point about reducing building investments? Redesign your company's offerings, breadth of product line, methods of operating, business models, ownership of facilities, and use of facilities to help slice spending on building investments by you and your stakeholders so that overall investments can be reduced by 96% compared to what you are uh, to what they are now in ways that will also help make your organization and your stakeholders more successful and profitable, as well as better able to generate and to sustain cash flow. So let's now look at reducing your and your stakeholders' land investments. So let me quote first from Isaiah chapter 36, verse 10. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. In this section, we consider how to constructively avoid land investments rather than destroy them. Having read and heard so much about the potential to make money from land investments through price appreciation, you're probably surprised to find them looking for how to spend less. So many people know about and appreciate the potential of land for value growth, but knowledge often leads to unnecessary investments. Just because the potential to gain from an investment doesn't mean you should spend more than is absolutely necessary. When you invest too much, you just reduce your cash flow and raise your costs. Most organizations spend a great deal more than they need on land. Let me give you a few examples. A home building company was very sensitive to the need to gain zoning and regulatory approvals before it could begin constructing homes. The point in the development process for profits and positive cash flow began feeling risk averse. This company would buy every single acre 
it might ever need for housing development, even if there was no possibility that some of the land would be built on during the next seven years. When I challenged that approach, the company discovered it could control a piece of property just as effectively through a series of inexpensive options to purchase parts of the total acreage. As a result, land could be purchased only a few days before construction began on an individual parcel. The company was pleasantly surprised to find the combined cost of the options plus the purchase prices were just the same as if the company bought the land ahead of time, paid interest costs, and real estate taxes over the subsequent years. Why? The sellers were planning to set up large investments in raw land or accustomed to carrying such costs. Some landowners gained tax advantages by delaying the time of sale. As landowners were confident that all the land would eventually be purchased, they didn't mind the slower rate of actual transactions. If all the options were acted on the remaining land, they still owned was much more valuable. So landowners knew they would probably be better off to sign options to home builders. In a different case, a restaurant company decided to cut investment costs by putting a warehouse and its corporate headquarters on the same land, land that was much more valuable than most organizations would use for storage. The location also wasn't very good for distributing the goods. As a result, the costs of warehousing distribution were higher than they needed to be. Eventually, the company sold the land with the headquarters warehouse to different parcels on much less expensive land. The price received the original land was equal to the total value of all the company's public shares at the time. In a third instance, a different company planned to add capacity for one of its business lines. Rather than adding on to existing plants uh, where they had extra land, the company decided to buy a parcel in a different part of the country that was closer to some cust customers in hopes of cutting shipping costs. Forecasting a lot of rapid growth, the firm bought three times the land it expected to need immediately in an undeveloped area. After the purchase, the company shifted its business strategy, however, to de-emphasize volume growth. As a result, the company never needed any of the new land it had purchased. All the purchase price plus the efforts and costs involved in obtaining zoning were wasted. The land was eventually sold for pittance compared to the company's investment. A fourth company decided to consolidate many smaller plants. In doing so, it designed a plant that was optimized for producing the product mix from those plants. Later, one of the plant's products became very unprofitable, a product that kept two-thirds of the plant busy. If the company pulled out of that product line, it made no sense to have the plant on that site. The investment was totally wasted because the building was so special purpose, reducing the value of the land by the potential cost of demolishing the building and limited general purpose needs for such a parcel shape. For years, the company dilly-dallied with keeping the site and all the products going, satisfying no one while losing money and tying up a lot of extra investment capital. Another common error is to put unnecessary in unnecessary site improvements. For instance, a concert operator built a facility in parking lot, which of course takes a lot of land to serve 15,000 patrons, but the nearby access road could only accommodate 4,000 patrons in a reasonable amount of time. As a result, almost two-thirds of the land investment was wasted. The same entrepreneur also started building a site in another state, investing a million dollars in improvements before finishing a business plan. After the plan was completed, it became clear that the whole site was a bad one for the concert venue. The site improvement money was wasted. Part of making money from land appreciation is to be able to sell it to a wide variety of high-priced purposes. If you put a chemical plant on the land and let the chemicals leak in the ground, poison the soil, the land won't go up in value. At some point, you will instead spend a fortune digging up and carting away the old soil. The land probably won't ever be used for anything more valuable than its landfill. Your land and building investments can influence what else goes into that area. If you also encourage the right kind of zoning, new neighbors will lift the value of your land and later you'll be able to sell your land for much more to your neighbors or to those who want such neighbors. Mistakes concerning land don't end with the company's own investments. Strategies and policies may also force stakeholders to buy too much land and spend too much money in other ways. As an example, many manufacturing organizations provide big price discounts at the end of the quarter to encourage uh, distributors, retailers, customers, and ultimate users to stock up on items that they won't need for many months. Why are such large discounts offered? Well, the people who buy the goods when they don't need them may have to incur extra interest costs or borrow money to finance the purchases. They may also have to buy or rent extra warehouses on bigger parcels of land to protect the goods. In addition, the purchasers will experience product losses during such extended storage. Here are six principles you should keep in mind while making land investments. First, don't buy until you're sure you need the land. Second, if you won't be using all the land right away, explore purchasing options to buy the remaining land later at a price that is fixed now. Third, design your processes to use as little land as possible. 
forth plan your work sites and warehouses to be reused 20 years later by different organizations for much higher value purposes. Five, add as much capacity in existing land as possible for acquiring new land. Six, look at your suppliers, partners, distributors, retailers, customers, and end users and consider how your strategies, policies, methods, and marketing effort affect how much land each of them has to use and for what purposes. Consider how you could shrink the total land usage in your value chain. In thinking about such perspectives, it's clear that you should not focus solely on reducing land investments and making these decisions. Choose instead to have a business model that optimizes the overall opportunity to produce more sales to cut costs and to reduce total investments. Again, your thinking should not stop with the limits of your organizational boundaries. You also need to consider how your reduced usage of land can be combined with other decisions to also slice kind of investments for suppliers, partners, customers, 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 end users, and any other stakeholders. Otherwise, you're just moving to reduce cost of your land investments around rather than actually avoiding investments. When that happens, the cost of such increased stakeholder investments will eventually come out of your profitability and cash flow in some indirect way. Good business model design should have as one of its goals limiting the amount of money spent on investments. Throughout the supply chain, the need to <coughs> And are needed to sustain consumption. In many manufacturing businesses, it's not unusual for there to be $1 of land investment to support every $12 in sales. A better goal would be to have $1 of land investments to support every $100 in sales. How low can you go without harming sales, increasing costs, or expanding total investments in other ways? Here's where offering design can play a role. There are many different ways to look to serve the same need. Some offering designs are much more capital intensive than others. Look hard to the choices that don't require much land investment. So what's the key point about reducing land investments? Redesign your company's offerings, breadth of product line, methods of operating, business models, ownership of facilities, and use of facilities to help slice the amount of money spent on land investments by you and your stakeholders so that overall investments can be reduced by 96% compared to what they are now in ways that will also make your organization and your stakeholders more successful and profitable and better able to generate to sustain cash flow. So let's look finally at reducing your and your stakeholders' equipment investments. Here let me quote from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 6, verse 7. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry, so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. In this section, we investigate constructive ways to avoid equipment investments. The subject reminds me of the experience I had while I was consulting with a major automotive supplier to General Motors in the 1980s. At that time, one of the GM CEO's children worked for my client. I could tell the ideas I was sharing my client concerning business investments were reaching GM as well. However, something was lost in transmission, and GM kept doing the wrong things. From that experience, I learned sometimes people need help to correctly apply business concepts. At one time, it was believed that total automation was the appropriate goal for manufacturing and service businesses alike. That belief was stirred by the observation of Japanese companies, whose firms seemed unstoppable to Americans in the early 1980s, rather, were headed that way. The belief was uh, the business headline, but many people didn't realize the underlying purpose. Japan had an aging population was headed for a future shortage of skilled workers. Pretty much every other country with an advanced economy had an oversupply of skilled manufacturing workers. As a result of following the Japanese example, companies such as GM and Motorola sought total automation as fast as possible, even when that approach was more expensive and capital intensive. A big mistake. Today, it's well understood that the best manufacturers and service providers use as little automation as possible. Why? Workers prefer and produce more when they experience more human interaction and interesting activities than what automation usually provides. As a result, less automation often leads to higher quality, lower costs, and higher sales. There is an exception. Some jobs are best done by robots or automated processes because the work is very dangerous and disagreeable. An example is replacing water pipes next to an active nuclear reactor. Another example is spraying car parts with toxic chemicals. Automation has other problems. It usually takes a long time to change the setup so a different item or service can be produced. Second, it adds total investment much faster than by using more employees and less equipment. It makes companies more reluctant to improve business models. 2,000% solutions are rarely achieved through automation. 
it takes a long time to do well. It adds fi to fixed costs, so the profits and cash flow are worse during industry downturns. And most people automate old processes, which usually aren't very good ones to begin with. One of my clients coined an expression that proce about processes that we quoted in the 2000% solution. Eliminate, simplify, and then automate. Today, I think that uh, my client's concept should be applied first to a business model. After unnecessary business model elements have been eliminated, the remainder simplified, then see if any of the remaining methods can be eliminated and simplified so your offerings don't need much, if any, equipment. Lastly, consider what automation might be appropriate only at that point. Past lessons have discussed taking a product and turning it into a service that doesn't require very many assets, such as providing information rather than a product as well as the idea of taking a service and turning it into a product that doesn't require many assets, such as an upscale restaurant provided cooking videos can be downloaded from the internet. Such thinking about business models is very helpful as the first step in eliminating equipment. Also question how much of the products or services value added you should provide through your own manufacturing service operations. In many cases today, another organization can do value added tasks much better and less expensive than you can. That's particularly true if your offering is likely to have a short market life, such as with most electronic items. In many cases, your supplier is likely to have a, uh, uh, to reuse equipment for other companies. By using the equipment for more customers, the total equipment investment is less than if the company made its own products and provided its own services. In addition, consider if the customers might prefer to use some equipment for their own enjoyment. Many people, for instance, like to tinker with old cars. If you make the cars so they require very specialized equipment to repair and tune, some car enthusiasts will be turned off. Instead, uh, you might design the car so customers can easily do their own work and automotive repair shops can also provide good service without making extensive equipment investments for infrequent repairs. Such a solution will probably mean a car manufacturer would also require less equipment. If customers already have excellent equipment, then provide offerings that make the customer's equipment more desirable. For instance, many people would like to prepare gourmet meals at home as a source of personal satisfaction, but don't have the knowledge and skill to do so. Since some of these people have kitchens full of equipment usually found in fine restaurants, food companies might provide offerings that people can easily employ with such sophisticated equipment to make extraordinary dishes. Here are six principles you should keep in mind when making equipment investments. First, don't buy until you're sure you can't improve your business model anymore during the expected life of the equipment. Second, redesign your process to use a little, as little equipment as possible. Third, if you won't be using all the equipment continually, explore rental and leasing options that would allow you to only employ what you need. Fourth, plan for ways to create higher salvage values for your equipment once economic life in your operations is over. Fifth, increase throughput on existing equipment before acquiring any more equipment. Six, look at your suppliers, partners, distributors, retailers, customers, and end users to see how your strategies, policies, methods, and marketing affect how much equipment each of them has to use and for what purpose. Consider how you can shrink that total equipment usage. In thinking about these perspectives, it's clear you should not focus only on equipment investments in making these decisions. Instead, you want to have a business model that optimizes the overall opportunity to produce more sales, to cut costs, and reduce total investment. Your thinking shouldn't stop at the limits of your organizational boundaries. You also need to consider how your reduced use of equipment can be combined with other decisions to also slash total investments for suppliers, partners, customers, 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 end users, and other stakeholders. Otherwise, you'll just be moving the costs of equipment around rather than actually reducing them or avoiding them. The costs of these stakeholder investments will eventually come out of your own profitable and cash flow in some indirect way. Business model design should seek to limit the amount spent on equipment investments through the supply chain to sustain consumption. In many manufacturing businesses, it's not unusual for there to be $1 of company equipment investments to support every $8 in sales. A better goal would be to have $1 of company's invest equipment investments to support every $50 in sales. How low can you go without harming sales, increasing costs, or expanding total investments in other ways? Let me remind you that offering design can play a role. There are many different ways to serve the same need. Some of them are more investment intensive than others. Look hard at the choices that don't require much equipment investment. So what's the key point about reducing equipment investments? We redesign your company's offerings, but the product line, methods of operating, business models, ownership of facilities, and use of facilities to slice the amount of money 
spent by union stakeholders on equipment investments so that total investments can be reduced by 96% compared to what they are now in ways that will help make your organization and stakeholders more successful and profitable, better able to generate and to sustain cash flow. I'm going to give you three assignments now to finish this lesson. First, identify the five most valuable ways you could reduce investments in buildings, land, and equipment that would provide the most benefits that customers and suppliers want. Second, consider how these changes would affect your other stakeholders. And then third, investigate how your business models, operating methods, breadth of product line and offerings could be shifted over time to be even more effective to make it easier for stakeholders in your company to operate with very little investment in buildings, land, and equipment. So I hope uh, this has been a long lesson, but hopefully it's one that has given you some valuable insights that will make you and your organization much more successful in serving all the stakeholders who are affected by what you do. In the meantime, before we speak again, may God bless you, your family, and all you do in the name of Jesus. Goodbye for now.